Thank you everyone for attending today, our Vandy in the Public Sector Think Tank Trio. Uh, to get us started, I wanted to just ask each of our panelists to share a brief introduction. If you don't mind just telling us your name, your position, your organization, and just a brief summary of what your organization does uh, to get started. Um, that'd be ideal. So yeah, name, position, organization, what that organization does. Um, do I have any first takers? Neil, Colleen, Mike, or anyone want to go first? Ladies first. Colleen, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Neil. I appreciate that. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, one of the benefits of the last uh, two years has been this awesome opportunity to be in front of you from very far away. So I'm very pleased to be able to join you and tell you more about the exciting life you can live as a, as a public policy advocate here in Washington, D.C., and I'm very pleased to be joined um, by my colleagues, Riker and Neil, uh, to talk about opportunities that are here. Uh, my name is Colleen Harmon. I'm the director of the Young Leaders Program at the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C., we are what is called a think tank, which means that we are, um, our mission is to formulate and promote public policy, which is based on the principles of free enterprise, limited government, individual freedom, traditional American values, and a strong national defense. We do that through our research institutes who do foreign, economic, and domestic policy. And we also promote that public policy to uh, the grassroots movements, to Congress, to the administration, and to people like you, which is where my job squarely falls in promoting our work to young professionals and college students across the country. So I'll leave it there. I'm looking forward to getting into your questions. I can go next. Uh, I'm Neil. I'm the student programs coordinator at the Cato Institute. Um, and so the Cato Institute, uh, similar to the Heritage Foundation and New America is a think tank in DC. We focus on, uh, we're a libertarian think tank, which kind of differentiates ourselves from the two other organizations. Um, but similarly, we focus on public policy research ranging from foreign policy, trade, um, and cybersecurity to domestic issues like healthcare, education, criminal justice reform, constitutional law, and the like. Um, and so Similar to Colleen, um, I organize our internship program among many other opportunities um, and I'm excited to talk about our opportunities and ways to get involved. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Riker Pasterkevich. Um, I work at New America. Uh, so we are a think, also a think tank. Uh, and so uh, where we kind of uh, differ is that um, from Heritage and Cato is that um, not only do we work on the sort of like research projects, but we also work on sort of consulting and implementation projects with governments of the state, federal, local, and international levels. Uh, and that's everything from cybersecurity to um, work family policy to political reform and uh, education policy and open technology. Um, so our, it kind of uh, spans the gamut in terms of policy areas. Uh, my job differs um, from Colleen and Niels uh, in the fact that um, I work in communications. So I work uh, with basically all of our external affairs. So be that um, events, uh, media relations, social media, and just sort of like anything that touches on the, the public facing aspects of all of New America's work is um, generally what I do day to day. Thank you so much, Riker. Um, and I really appreciate you all giving us that specific insight into your different organizations. But a common question I get, and one that I'm excited to ask you all is, what is a think tank? How would you define a think tank uh, in, in your own words? Yeah, um, and whoever, uh, we keep that same order if you want to go, like Colleen, Neil, Riker each time, if that'll be easier. But of course, feel free to chime in if, if you have enough answer. Thanks. I'm happy to be top of the batting order and then the guys can go clean up on if I make any <laughs> mistakes. Um, thank you. Um, so a think tank is, is something that is um, unique in a lot of ways um, because it is an indirect uh, group from the federal government and some of the other uh, institutions that exist in Washington, DC. Um, I worked in Congress a long time ago and I can attest to this. I was a scheduler on Capitol Hill and time is of the essence. And a lot of times in Congress, there isn't time for deep thought. Um, a lot of times it's reactions to votes. The Heritage Foundation in many ways was founded on the basis of some of the debates that were going on in the 1970s surrounding um, uh, debates on the supersonic jet uh, that was being under uh, addressed. And there were all kinds of 
ideas that had to be considered, the economic considerations, national security considerations, allies and treaties and these sorts of things. And it was a very complex issue, which of course our members of Congress are capable of doing and their staffs are very good at deep, um, going into and, and responding to, but there often isn't an uh, opportunity for a deep dive into the different principles and policies that allow that particular issue to be fully formed before a deliberative decision is made on it. And so think tanks uh, assist in that effort. Um, um, we have experts in particular um, subject areas, a lot of times framed by their view of what good policy and good constitutionalism is and what view they have for the world. Um, and they try to uh, create excellent public policy um, that allows us to be responsive and timely, but also uh, allows members of Congress to uh, more thoughtfully go about the issues that they're doing and to make the full consideration of that particular topic. And so um, I can't speak for the other think tanks, but we certainly have teams of professionals whose entire jobs are to just do that kind of deep work, that thoughtfulness on a particular policy area and its economic implications, its domestic policy implications, and what our role of the world is. And so that's where think tanks kind of work and they've developed over time. Many of them were formed during World War II um, to address some of the administrative challenges that had been presented um, by historical necessity at that time. Uh, and now are ways for us to advocate um, to Congress on policy policies we think important about the future of the United States. And I'll let Neil and Riker fill in uh, the details there. Yeah, just a few things to add. I, I think she did a, a really good um, summary of what think tanks do. I think it's um, important or, or notable to comment on kind of how they operate. So most of them are 501c3s, which essentially just means they're research organizations. They're producing research to effectively educate um, and provide influence on uh, both the public as well as uh, legislatures, whether that is in the uh, in, in state chambers or in the U.S. Congress. Um, but importantly, what we are not is a consulting uh, consulting firm or uh, a lobbying group. Um, so most of the time, again, it kind of just depends on on uh, which think tank you're talking about. But most think tanks are 501c3s. Most of them are just research uh, producing bodies, and they are just meant to kind of. Um, give influence to, to lawmakers, to provide them with, uh, with research in order to uh, help guide them in terms of policymaking. Um, what I kind of, um, uh, what I kind of think is a useful analogy is thinking of the ways that it differentiates between academia um, and, and, and the think tank. You know, academics are largely producing very similar work and similar research, but they're mostly talking to other academics. Whereas the goal of a think tank, and a lot of think tank scholars are, you know, adjunct fellows or, or scholars at universities. They might have come from the government, um, but really the goal is to produce research in the same way, um, but that is digestible for the public and for uh, for lawmakers. So um, that's kind of the where I'll leave off and then uh, leave it to Riker. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with um, everything that Colleen and Neil said. Um, and the only thing that I would add in addition is like I said, that sort of like New America also dabbles in like the, the consulting and, and implementation processes. And that's sort of, um, depending on what type of project it is and sort of how long we are funded to do to do a certain project or uh, that that we are able to help uh, in a sort of technical assistance capacity to uh, with when like a local government or a state government is working on implementing one of the programs that we've researched and kind of advised them on um, that that is sort of the the next step in the process because we really believe that you know, it, it's nice to just kind of provide a research base, but without any action on it, it's, you know, it's just kind of providing, uh, your, their, your research isn't going anywhere necessarily unless there's sort of like a next translatable step. Um, so we're, we're really trying to work to, to bridge that gap between the, the sort of traditional think tank research mission and then um, action and implementation. Really cool. Well, awesome. Thank you all for those descriptions. Uh, helpful for me as well as I'm sure helpful for the students. Um, so if this next question, if any, this is confidential, of course, just let me know and we can move on to the next one. But I was curious, could you just give us maybe an example of a specific project or policy that your think tank worked on and just give us from like conception to conclusion, what happened, like when does it come across your desk? How, how do you decide to work on specific things and where does it go from there? What are the steps you take to, to research and to, as you were talking about Riker, to like find that actionable step afterwards? 
I'm really going to lean heavily on Neil and Riker for this one. Um, a lot of my work is taking the excellent things that our think tank does and um, distributing that to other people. Um, but uh, in coalition relations, which is part of what I'm doing, in a lot of ways, we're both the beginning and the end of that process. That is that at the beginning, we're hearing from across the nation, from across uh, our different coalition partners, what is important in the states and on a local level, and then what issues are rising to the level of national attention. So a lot of times that's information I give back to my teams uh, here at Heritage so that they can figure out what kind of research is happening in both approximate and a longer future goal. Um, and then on the end of that step, once that research is developed, we're bringing it back to those teams and back to those communities so that it can arm them with the information that they need and want and also respond to some of the questions that those partners and advocates find to be important on a community level. Um, but a lot of times, uh, at least at the Heritage Foundation, because we're found Founded, um, with the, as Neil put so um, well, with the, the importance of educating Congress, a lot of times Congress sets those particular goals um, in their, uh, the bills that they put in the top 10 order of their ranking each year in Congress. That tells us the uh, majority and the minority opinions on what they think to be the most important things driving the United States. And as a, a democratic republic, we are in, uh, going to be looking to that legislative body. We're also looking to the president's defined executive agenda. Agenda. Um, and we are, of course, uh, looking to the different issues that are coming up in the judicial circuits to better understand the kind of pulse of America and then to better define those actionable goals, as well as conservatives in thinking through what are the things that we uh, are trying to preserve and where is there room for opportunity and innovation to forward American prosperity um, on the economic, domestic, and foreign policy level. So it's kind of partly motivated by um, what our government is doing, partly motivated by what Americans are thinking and then partly uh, influenced by world events and, and what we think to be important with the different agendas that are being set. So I'll, I'll hit it over to the guys to, to finish up that. Yeah, I, I think um, it's helpful to think about some of the products that think tanks produce, right? So some, some scholars are working on books and, and that's, you know, from start to finish, you're starting with literature reviews, you're, you're looking at the academic literature and you're, you're writing books. Others are, are putting memos or op-eds out in newspapers, they're going on television. Um, you know, there's also white papers or policy analyses. So there's everything from long, from, from short to, to long range um, policy analysis that they're doing. Um, you know, uh, Emily Eakins is a, is a pollster. So she's conducting uh, her own survey design and, and looking at different public opinion polling. And with 20 years on 9-11, that looked at how do Americans feel in terms of national security, 9-11, the war on terror, et cetera. Um, there's a number of different like issue areas that these uh, that these scholars that at all of these three think tanks are, are looking at um, in terms of immigration and, and, and criminal numbers, in terms of, uh, you know, are immigrants actually committing crimes or not? Um, in terms of school choice, um, looking at, you know, the safety of, of public schools versus uh, school choice on, on educational outcomes. One particular project that I think is, is more illustrative is the um, is our uh, goal of abolishing qualified immunity, which really I think is illustrative of the many different kind of uh, components that it reaches. So um, abolishing qualified immunity, hopefully you have heard of it before as it gained national salience um, in the aftermath of the shooting of George Floyd or of the, the, the murder of George Floyd. But um, really um, Cato had been looking at abolishing QI for a long time. Uh, which was really hard to gain traction in Congress. Um, it was after the death of George Floyd that then you saw uh, the national kind of public opinion um, and scrutiny start to shift. Um, so then, you know, it was our senior vice president for policy who started actually looking at how can we make how can we make, we make this more salient. And so, um, on you know, on the one hand, they are filing amicus briefs to the Supreme Court uh, under the the last docket. They were looking at taking up almost ten different instances of qualified immunity. They didn't actually take up a case because it looked as if uh, Congress might have acted in in terms of uh, of legislation. Uh, you saw a couple of bills both in the House and the Senate that were uh, looking at abolishing qualified immunity. Unfortunately, they didn't go anywhere. Um, but then also most interestingly, so, so we had a team, our federal affairs team, uh, who were uh, talking to Congress, uh, who were filing Supreme Court amicus curiae, um, in addition to our video broadcast team who were producing YouTube videos and, and videos that could be shared on, on social media, just explaining what exactly qualified immunity is. 
Um, and then we also interestingly had a state affairs team. Um, and our state affairs team was then talking to, to state legislatures and looking at the ways that they can roll back qualified immunity um, on the state level. And I forget which state just passed. I believe it's either Arizona or Maryland. I could be mistaken. Uh, but basically, they were also taking a, a state approach in terms of rolling back QI. Um, and so I, I think that that kind of project itself is, is very illustrative. And I'll try and provide a link to that specific project while Riker is explaining a, a project of theirs. Sure, thanks, Neil. Um, so one of the projects that we have been working on uh, is the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship, which aims to engage the private sector, uh, K-12 school districts, and um, local uh, and uh, higher education systems um, in uh, connecting, high, making sort of like high school education more relevant towards the, or for the broader skills that um, individuals will need as they um, enter the workforce and sort of and go to college and work their way through the, the community college systems or through um, traditional four-year higher education. Um, and so back in early 2017, we completed a two-year research project on, um, on uh, this idea and sort of like uh, the various places it was being incubated around the United States. And then sort of worked with a bunch of um, funders of ours to um, fundraise to uh, essentially select nine grantee sites around the entire country and really incubate those programs and support them with technical assistance from other organizations um, around the, the sort of in the DC space, um, in the policy space to provide technical assistance, um, to make sure that they have the tools that they need to overcome policy barriers at the um, local and state levels and however they were operating. Um, and also just uh, to think about equity considerations as well as um, just sort of like general program management um, and sort of like to, uh, to really build a community of practice around this. Um, and so now we are four years in after that and um, we have uh, six more grantees. So we have a, a nice cohort of 15, um, which is uh, really great to kind of see the program grow. And so we've um, selected them kind of all across the country. And um, we've, I think at this point have over, I think over 30,000 apprentices. Um, throughout the entire country in areas, not just like the traditional building trades, but also like finance, IT, nursing and healthcare, just sort of like all these different types of um, fields that didn't really have an apprent a traditional apprenticeship system, much like the building trades have had for, for a really, really long time. Um, so it's been really interesting to kind of see that program grow and evolve over the course of um, the last six or seven years. Those were all exceptional answers. Yeah, thank you all for taking the time to go into detail about some of those. Um, and it sounds like such meaningful work that you're all doing. And I'm grateful the students got to hear that uh, just because so often whenever people talk about like, I want to work with policy or I want to make a difference in X way, um, people are just confused about what think tanks are and don't realize how you can make these contributions like the way that you all are. Uh, so really thank you for, for that answer. Um, and so I think we've gone enough into me asking just like, what the heck is a think tank? Um, I wanna move on from there and get into more of your feelings about working at a think tank. So if each of you wouldn't mind going uh, on to what is your favorite part of your job and what is your least favorite part of your job? Oh gosh, this is a tough question actually. Um, so I have been, um, this is my second tour at the Heritage Foundation. I started as an intern in fall 2013 after I graduated from college and I worked in our development department and then was hired shortly after to be an admin assistant to one of the directors, specifically in the department that does American political theory, which was kind of an interesting um, part of that because it, it was an unusual department um, because it focused on the foundations of American political thought and not just kind of like dial up a founder quote but more of a deep study of whether or not uh, those principles and the political theory um, established at the time of the Constitution could really stand the test of today. And that's the question that I think is really at the heart of American political, um, the American political environment of whether, uh, how are we to understand this thing and how are we to understand ourselves as Americans? So my favorite part of the job is the deep dive into those questions of how to better understand the uh, interior logic of a conservative or a libertarian or a progressive uh, point of view, um, and also to better understand the good intentions of the Americans who work in this field, who really want to see change, who want to bring good into the world, and who especially want to better the lives of Americans. And I, every day, get to 
be surrounded by those thoughts and engage in them and be surrounded by colleagues who have a great heart for each other and who have a great heart for the country and want to see it succeed um, and want more liberty and more prosperity. And so that's my favorite part is just being surrounded by that every day and having these conversations across the aisle, um, but also trying to, through the, the competition of ideas, propose the best ways uh, for that to come about. Uh, the most difficult part of my job is how busy we are, how much work there has to do, and so how little time there really is to dive into those questions on a daily basis, despite being surrounded by them. Um, and so it, it requires me to get up earlier and stay up later and, and have great conversations at receptions and other things in DC. Um, I'm not good at small talk and it's for this very reason because I want I want to deep dive into the, into the ideas. Um, and so uh, that's the difficulty, that there's a lot of work to be done and obviously it's no no secret to you that we're in a bit of a polarized political environment and um, it's difficult to find areas of agreement and compromise and it worries me that our country is divided and so um, those are the the difficult parts of, of being here sometimes DC can feel a little bit heavy um, but it's heavy with a good cause and I and I think it's important to remember that um, that most everyone is here because they believe uh, in the American project and they want our future to be to be good so uh, yeah yeah, I, I feel similarly to Colleen. I think, um, you know, my background is in foreign policy. Um, and so joining Cato, that was kind of my, my sole focus. Um, and so what I like most about this job is that um, I am, I get to, to work adjacent to all of these different departments I have to hire in all of these different departments, which also means I need to be um, at least um, knowledgeable enough to, uh, to know if someone's a good fit. And so I'm able to read and uh, absorb a lot of the research and information um, and so get a, a much better foundational understanding of uh, different policy issue areas that um, at least academically I wasn't exposed to. So that's kind of my, my favorite um, aspect of working at Cato. Um, and you just work alongside extremely smart individuals um, who have thought about and thought deeply about all of these different uh, issues. And so if you, if and when you have questions about almost anything, you can just uh, go to them. Um, you know, I think what is, what I have found uh, difficult about, um, and this isn't just really my, my Cato hat, but also my, um, my hat as uh, someone with a degree in foreign policy, and I, I graduated uh, with my master's two years ago, um, it's very competitive. It's a really competitive field. Um, everyone has a high degree of specialization. Um, mine is genocide and mass atrocity prevention research, which is even uh, more narrowly focused. Um, so what I have kind of come to understand is that um, you know, it, it is, um, it's hard to penetrate. Uh, you need a lot of experience. Um, but additionally, I think that um, a lot of the ways that, um, you know, if you look at kind of the organizational structure, uh, you also end up realizing that not, not always, uh, there, there's certainly a lot of, um, a lot of positions um, that are just outside of the, the very niche role of research. Um, in terms of both what what Riker and Colleen do in terms of communications and um, and the Young Leaders Program, but um, I have found that you know there there tends to be a ceiling when it comes to um, whether or not you just have your bachelor's or your master's. Um, a lot of these people that you end up working with and a lot of the scholars in think tanks are highly educated, and so um, one of the more challenging aspects is figuring out kind of what your next step is, how you go about getting that experience, um, and and so I, I think that that has just been a little bit challenging in terms of the um, of the job front of, of figuring out kind of what the next step is, um, and just and just the ways that uh, people are kind of advanced through this career. It's oftentimes that people will kind of um, go out of the think tank space to get more experience, to go back into the think tank space. There's a lot of revolving doors. So um, that's just something to, to think about. I hate to sound <laughs> like a broken record, but um, I will largely echo what Colin and Neil said. Um, I love that I get to work on uh, sort of so many different policy areas all the time, um, whether that's working it with higher education or K-12 education or cybersecurity or and privacy or um, sort of like family policy and um, political reform, just sort of all of the various different topic areas um, and absorbing all of that uh, knowledge is just, it's so exciting and um, to sort of uh, work alongside really, really super smart people who are also incredibly good people. It's one thing I will say about New America. Um, everybody is super 
wonderful to work with and um, really, really wants to like bend over backwards to, to get to know you as a person and as a professional. And um, it's a really uh, welcoming environment and, and community. Um, but yeah, and then just, just sort of see all of the incredible ideas that they're coming up with to, 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 to further American security and prosperity um, in the next 50 years, 100 years um, is, is really, really inspiring every single day. Um, I will <laughs> largely echo what Colleen said, um, resources and capacity are always a, a constraint. Um, so, you know, I wish that there, you know, there's so much work to do every single day. I wish that there was, you know, 26 hours in a day so that, <laughs> that I could spend a couple of more hours working and getting things done or just catching up on reading that I, that I would really um, like to do or prefer to do um, that I don't always get around to doing um, is uh, definitely something I would, would uh, like to do more of. Um, and then I will also echo what Neil said, um, that it is kind of a revolving door oftentimes because we do so much work um, with um, the private sector and with government and just sort of all different types of, of groups that people will often leave New America or the think tank space um, to go work at another organization only to boomerang back. Um, and so it is always a, a smart idea to, to maintain good relationships because you never know sort of like you know, if somebody who's working for you will be your boss one day or, or vice versa. So, um, so I think that that's, um, it's, a, it's a really interesting space in that respect and it's not necessarily as, as hierarchical as, as many um, uh, sort of positions in the private sector. Awesome, awesome. Well, hopefully this conversation is gonna inspire all attending students and students who view the recording in the future to help you out with those scarcity of resources and get more people working at think tanks and on these subjects. Uh, so we can fix that problem a little bit. Um, but I heard a little bit of this next question in some of your answers, but something I'm always curious about, and I think fellow students are, are curious about, um, I, I used to be the career coach for first and second year students, and I've never had an 18 year old student walk in my office and say, I wanna work at a think tank. Um, and so I'm curious, what did you study in college and how did you get to where you are now? So just in the interest of mixing it up, I'm going to pull an Uno reverse card and let Riker start off this question. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Sure. Um, so uh, in undergrad, I studied uh, anthropology and international relations. Um, and so, and I also uh, studied abroad in Argentina and China. So I had a, a fairly sort of like international affairs background. Um, and I did an internship um, for the State Department. And my first um, job out of uh, undergrad was was working for the State Department um, in the Secretary's Office of um, Global Partnerships, which was focusing on public-private partnerships all around the globe. Um, that was in the last year of the Obama administration. Um, and so, uh, and then after that, um, I transitioned out of that role and into my first position in New America, which was on the international side of the house, focusing on um, communications and, and marketing um, and sort of, and journalism uh, in, on the sort of internationally um, with all of our internationally focused programs. Um, and then about a year and a half year in, um, we were expanding some of our domestic policy teams and I transitioned over um, to that side of the house to sort of um, grow that team and step into my current role. Um, so it's kind of been a, a meandering path. Uh, <laughs> this is my first job and my only job in domestic policy, um, but I've been learning a lot and it's uh, been, been really, really interesting. So, and I think, Many people will, I don't, can't speak for Colleen or Neil, but I think many people in DC will, will echo that as it, I think that very few paths in DC are like super, super linear. Yeah. My path is super, super linear. Um, so my, uh, I did my undergrad at UGA, University of Georgia um, in sociology and international affairs. Um, I'm one of the, the only people who never changed their major. Um, and then tacked on sociology just because of how many courses I took that were interesting to me. Um, I, I did a lot of, um, I, I worked in uh, HIV prevention and outreach as a volunteer and intern. I did refugee resettlement internships. Um, I knew I wanted to move to DC and to study foreign policy. So I started my master's degree at uh, American studying foreign policy. Um, again, with this, with this focus on uh, like human rights and conflict prevention broadly, but more mass atrocity prevention. Um, I then first semester of grad school um, ended up like in, an, again, like you always hear about these crazy DC networking stories. And it's true. I ended up meeting um, an analyst at Cato. Um, he needed an intern and like 
submitted my resume and, you know, lo and behold, a week and a half later, um, I was an intern with him. Um, so I was doing a lot of foreign policy work. Um, it was then after that position that they, um, at, they were opening this current role in student programs and asked if I was interested. Um, and, you know, having a, a salary position while going through grad school, uh, while maintaining my, uh, you know, network with Cato and all of the relationships that I had already started building, um, it was really an invaluable opportunity. And so, um, so I took it. And so, um, of course, I had the sheer luck of graduating right before a pandemic, um, which has been um, kind of, it has thrown a wrench into uh, uh, finding the next position. But, you know, throughout grad school, I ended up taking on um, research assignments with air wars, looking at um, civilian casualties from drone strikes in the Middle East and, um, and working with uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in Guantanamo, looking at interrogation methods and torture. So like my trajectory has been fairly linear. Um, you know, this, this role that I'm in is a little bit more of an aberration, but again, I kind of like, as I said, it was pretty invaluable just in terms of the, the network, the contacts, um, and the people that I had at my fingertips, um, uh, you know, that I could leverage and stuff. And so, um, so anyway, here I am and, and it's been great. So I, as I mentioned, um, when I was in college, was always interested in politics, but ended up actually majoring in English. And part of that was because I wanted to be a great writer. And part of it is because um, I went to a, a very small school that had only, I think, eight degrees. We've since increased that to 10 of classical liberal arts majors. And English was really the one where I felt uh, that it was tracking a story that was combined with a historical perspective, the political context, and then also all of the philosophies of that particular time, but tied to an individual story. And I didn't realize it at the time, but that's really what politics is about. And um, that's really helped me along the way to become a better writer and speaker, and also to better understand um, how to listen to individual stories and, and tie that to the broader context. Um, so after graduation and while I was under college, um, in college, I interned in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, and then after graduation came to the Heritage Foundation, as I said, for an internship here and was hired on shortly afterwards. So I, uh, after being here for a little while, moved over to the House of Representatives to be a scheduler for about a year and a half for a member of Congress from Pennsylvania, which was an amazing experience, but a pretty quick burnout rate. And so when my alma mater offered me um, the opportunity to go back and be their director of career development, it seemed like an awesome opportunity because I knew that we needed more young people in DC and that my college didn't really have a program that helped um, transition uh, into the world um, of politics. And so I went back there for a year, but just really missed it. So it was a little bit of a career swerve, but came back to Heritage Foundation when they needed someone to manage the internship program, which was a great intersection of them both. Um, and so it was sort of a natural, I guess you could call that linear, but really um, through networking, through the opportunities that I had, I haven't looked for a job in a very long time um, because I am often offered opportunities based on those people that I know and, um, and, and who know my skill set and know my interests. And that's been a huge blessing for me. I've just been presented with these opportunities. Um, but now as I get into my career as a director, I still love what I do, but I'm interested in building out a little bit more of my academic center. Uh, Neil is excellent at this. He's such a specialist in his particular area. I am not. I am certainly a generalist. Um, so I'm currently getting my master's um, in American political thought and government um, right across the street from the Heritage Foundation at Hillsdale College. Um, and this has been a great major, but it is a unique one in Washington, DC, because often it's more and more of a specialization. You do security studies and then you do it in a particular wedge of that and you become kind of the analyst in that field. Um, I'm more interested kind of broadly in ideas. And so, for example, this semester, I'm taking a class on Shakespeare's The Henriad, which talks about how to be a good king and how to be a good military leader. And I love Shakespeare with my English major background. I'm taking a deep dive with a professor from the uh, US Army War College on Vietnam. And then I'm taking a class on the political foundations of liberalism and progressivism. So we're reading a lot of the foundational intellectual thinkers of that era and trying to understand what the differences are 
So for me, it's a very kind of strange liberal artsy major. Um, and I think that's unique to me, but it's also helped to inform how I develop programs, how I understand the political context, how I prepare my remarks. Um, and I hope it will give me the opportunity to um, write more in the future and speak more on these issues. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm unique and have been lucky to be able to choose opportunities um, that fit with kind of my personality and my, my interests, but also help me consistently broaden um, that scope so that I can uh, better understand the world around me. And I found that to be very valuable. I'm not sure what my career trajectory is, but I'm having a wonderful time and I'm enjoying every second of it. Um, so I'm happy to talk to you more about that as we go through. Oh, really awesome. Yeah, it's always, as a career counselor, I'm always just so intrigued about the winding paths people take to get to where they're going, because we always have this idea of like, oh, it's like step, 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 and then you're there. Um, not always the case, it turns out. Um, and so this next question, I think, is, is going to get to one of those earlier steps that I think students in particular will be interested in. What is recruiting like in this field? Do your organizations recruit? Is there a certain time students should get applying or certain strategies that they should employ to work at uh, the Cato Institute or New America or anything like that? I guess I'm going first still. Um, so New America does not have uh, particular hiring timelines or sort of like cyclical recruiting cycles for um, our full-time positions. The, the positions that are most cyclical are internships. Um, so I would look for those sort of you know, two to three months in advance of the, the semester, whether that's fall, spring or summer that you're looking to um, work with us. Um, so just kind of peruse our website, um, you know, subscribe to our newsletters, all of our job postings are in there. Um, but for sort of full-time positions, no, we don't have um, sort of cyclical recruiting cycles. Just monitor our website every couple of months and, and, <laughs> and hope something comes up that's a good fit. Yeah, the Cato Institute and Heritage are pretty similar. Uh, we have recurring um, internship programs. Um, so if you're interested in getting involved with Cato, I'm gonna submit a form to the chat. Um, it would be great for you to just uh, give us your contact info. And, um, and that's just for me to let you know about some of the uh, conferences we have coming up, but most importantly, our deadline, uh, which the, uh, the spring 22 application deadline is November 1st. Um, so we basically we've got kind of two two things. One is the internship program, which I recruit for, um, uh, doing information sessions like this and career fairs, etc. Um, and then the other the the entry level uh, opportunity is our research associate uh, role. We are building out a two year program for that role, but it is not necessarily up and running yet. So basically, right now. Um, apply for any RA position if and when they're available, but there is no uh, set timeline for uh, available slots. What I will say, though, is that, um, you know, by far the, the best way to get those roles is through an internship uh, position. Uh, you establish um, rapport with the hiring director. You work one-on-one -on -one usually with them. Um, you know, so even if you are a recent graduate um, or planning to go to grad school, et cetera, I would strongly urge an internship program um, you know, there, it's a really, really good way to get involved um, and to network. And so that is the best way to get involved with Cato um, and certainly the best way to get entry level positions. Yes, our process is similar, as Neil said, at the Heritage Foundation. We have a spring, summer, and fall internship. Our spring internship deadline is this Sunday, um, which I believe is the 24th, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Sunday the 24th at midnight. But if you need a little bit more time, please let me know. I'm happy to extend a little bit of a, a Vanderbilt uh, extension here. Um, we are pay our interns, um, which is not unusual for Washington, D.C. now, which is great news. There were a lot of unpaid internships when I was looking for interns, and I'm glad that we've normalized payment. It's a difficult and expensive city to break into, and I'm so pleased that there are more opportunities for people of all backgrounds to be able to come here and participate in American government. Um, so I will uh, drop our career page there as well, and I'll also drop in the chat more about our internship program if you're interested. We also have graduate um, fellow programs in healthcare and in welfare studies, um, so if you're interested in that or that's a particular area, we're going to be hiring those research assistants for a year as well to study with our analysts. And then we also have something called the Academy, um, which is an online program that was started during COVID and has been continued by my colleagues in the True Luck Center, which is a weekly program with people from all over the world talking about um, different 
policy issues, talking about leadership, um, being able to get a deep dive into what's happening in Afghanistan or how are we to think about healthcare policy or education policy. And so that's something you can do right from the comfort of your class uh, or your classroom or your dorm room. It's, uh, I know it's another thing to add, but it's a great way to meet people who are interested in politics from around the country and to have uh, that conversation with them as well. So I'll drop the various links in the chat and I'll make sure to follow up with, um, with your team afterwards to make sure you get that information too. Thank you all so much for that answer. Um, and yeah, definitely students pay attention to those links, uh, write them down, copy and paste them from the chat now if you can. Um, and I wanted to ask, and I don't know how much, uh, Colleen, it sounds like you're more involved with it, the interns than maybe the other two, but is there anything in particular you're looking for in your interns? Or is there anything that you think college students can do to make themselves a, uh, a good looking prospect for your different internships? Yes, and I know Neil is greatly involved in the Cato internship as well, so he can talk more about that. Um, really, what I'm looking for in interns is um, a, a uh, ability to write well and speak well, which doesn't always come through in the applications, but will come through in our interviews with them, um, because we have tended to see that the interns who do those two things quite well um, have the furthest career trajectory. Um, in Washington, D.C., those are to the two kind of basic axiomatic foundational skills that you must have. Um, not that we aren't constantly improving on that. I don't hold myself up as an example, particularly. Um, but also uh, interns who, who have an idea of what they believe and why. Um, particularly uh, have given some thought to what they think is um, a good vision for the future of the country, what their participation level would be. And then just people that, uh, particularly for me, I, I kind of look for what I could describe as scrappy interns, um, people who might not be able to have other opportunities in the city, but want to get their foot in the door. Um, we have a pretty extensive application process for our interns, and um, it's, it takes about an hour to fill out the application and it asks particular questions. And it's not because there's a right or wrong answer, even though the Heritage Foundation does have particular um, policy kind of recommendations or a particular position on those things, but it's really to better understand how you think and how you articulate those thoughts and how you came to that conclusion. And so I think that that's a really great thing to have in Washington, D.C. in general, as you're going into interviews or as you're looking for opportunities, the ability to have put some consideration into um, what you want to do, not just to make money or not just to, um, to, to you know, be very successful to your friends at home in your glamorous life in D.C., but to truly make a difference um, in the term current political climate um, and to um, have some sense of what your skills and talent can contribute to that effort, whether that be for a member of Congress or to a particular organization. Yeah, um, similarly, I mean, I would echo everything that Colleen said, um, you know, uh, the Heritage Foundation, New America, and Cato, among you know all, almost all of the other internship or inter think tanks in DC, um, our mission oriented have a, a vision for uh, for policy and, and good policy. And so, um, you know, on the one hand, I would always urge, uh, same as Colleen, to think about um, kind of uh, where you philosophically are aligned and, and kind of um, uh, what organizations are uh, mission oriented that align with your own philosophy. Um, so th that's kind of one thing, um, though at Cato, we're kind of um, being libertarian, uh, we, we tend to get people from all over the political spectrum, uh, people from right of center, left of center on particular issues. Um, we're, not per we're not so keen on, on hiring libertarians as much as we're interested in hiring people who are qualified and who um, are aligned with the specific department that they're working in. Um, the placements page that I just submitted to the chat is going to um, articulate some of the more um, skills that we are looking for. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of these different positions and Cato's not alone in that a lot of these different positions are um, highly technical or are looking for different skills, right? So our 
uh, foreign policy department is looking for totally different skills than say media relations or healthcare. Um, so that placements page is gonna be a really good guide to understand what you're looking for. Um, what I usually say to people in the think, who are interested in entering the think tank space um, are to um, not undersell themselves. If you do not have a resume chock full of internship experiences, um, recognize um, and, and recall what I said earlier about kind of how academia and the think tank world are largely producing similar stuff, but for different audiences. And so a lot of the skills that you use in the classroom are highly transferable. Um, a lot of the reports that we're writing or uh, analyses that we are producing, um, you know, they're doing, they're conducting literature reviews. They are uh, using footnotes and citations. Um, our, our uh, you know, legal scholars are doing uh, legal writing and writing amicus briefs and legal memos. Um, a lot of the time you are going to be using data and doing econometrics or running regressions. You're using Excel, Stata, R, Python. Um, so all of these skills are presumably ones that you have built in the classroom um, and that you're already familiar with that you would then just be applying to the work undertaken at, at any of these different think tanks. Um, so when you are applying, I would just urge you to think about those technical skills that you possess that are highly transferable. Um, and then again, match that with the kind of uh, philosophical um, orientation um, that you find yourself in and, and apply to positions that um, that match up to to those uh, to that. So, yeah, um, I will largely agree with everything that Colleen and Neil said. Um, the only thing that I would add is like because I, I come from a sort of specific department for media relations and communications and marketing, um, and that I would you know if you are trying to work, uh, apply for a policy position, do not try to backdoor yourself into a policy position via another department. I would say that too often when. Um, People apply for my internships or, or like full-time jobs. Um, they are they are essentially back trying to backdoor themselves into a policy position, and I can see that right on their resume. So if your intention is to go for a policy position, definitely apply for that, and don't I would say don't don't apply to departments that you're you're not interested in just because you want to work in the think tank space um, is is a is a big recommendation of mine. I would also say, and Neil, you absolutely nailed it, there are particular skills. I sometimes tend to forget about them because a lot of times interns are just coming from similar backgrounds, the college experiences that you have. So I would just add finally, think tanks are a really cool opportunity because there are so many, there's so much overlap between different departments. It's sort of a one-stop shop for all of the things that are going on in Washington, DC. And it's a great way to get your foot in the door to better see and interact with them. You might be in a communications major and actually realize that donor communications is a really cool thing by working in development or be in the event space and realize that um, you really wanna work in audiovisual and video creating and all of these different things. So um, I would recommend being in a think tank because it's a good way to immerse yourself in sort of all of the different um, particulars of how policy comes about. And um, you also aren't limited to simply policy. And as Riker said, you shouldn't be the back door to get to policy. We need you to be able to have those skills to function on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think it's really important to be able to immerse yourself in that to better understand maybe where your career in Washington DC could ultimately land. Awesome. Well, yeah, those are all great answers. Students, I hope you were taking notes. Uh, some good insight there. Um, and definitely can guide what skills you should be developing in your time at Vanderbilt. Um, but we have reached the 1250 mark. And so I just wanted to ask students, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and unmute yourself and ask them. Or if you would prefer to submit them through the chat, I can lead them off there to our panelists. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions right now, just let me know. If you're all good, that's okay as well. Nolan, I see it. I see. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself. Thanks, Alex. That was a real hand raise. I don't think we get a lot of those these days. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. What you're saying is wonderful and, and fascinating, and it's great to meet you virtually. I have a question about your research processes, please. I know that a lot of the time when thinking about optimal policies, it can be helpful to maintain something of an open mind and see, is this idea which I've developed philosophically really how things work when, when I put data to test my assumptions and beliefs. I'm curious how that works when think tanks have partisan policy preferences. So how do you go about sort of the let me see what I can find while also saying, and I would like it to be somewhere in this space. I would say on particular issues, just look at, at the, like 
if there's a particular policy issue that you're interested in, go on New America Heritage Cato and just type that into the search bar and you'll see kind of um, how these scholars approach um, approach their research. I think too often people assume that they come um, that they come to their research with a preconceived um, notion or outcome that they're willing to like test um, to, to just meet their, uh, their, their preconceived assumptions. It's not usually the case. I mean, like we dis we disagree on particular policy issue areas all the time. Um, but more often than not, I would say that it's like, you're talking about the difference in terms of like trade-offs. A lot of the policy differences that we're talking about, um, and, and, and what they're optimizing are just in terms of trade-off and what we value, et cetera. I don't know if other people want to jump in on that, but. Yes, I would yeah. just say, I'm oh, sorry. Riker, go ahead. No, I'll you. Thanks. So I would just say that I think that is, as, as Neil said, kind of a, a misconception. Uh, most of, if not all of our analysts are really focused on letting the data speak for itself. And a lot of times what we're trying to balance are particular um, visions that we have for um, the United States that we believe at least at the Heritage Foundation are constitutionally delineated. So the goal we're trying to accomplish is not like X in policy per se, but more of how do we understand the role of Congress when it comes to a strong national defense, for example, and what does that look like from a budget perspective to balance out this other principle that we have, which is um, balanced budgets and making sure that we're financially feasible and how do we balance that against having kind of this idea of what are we fighting for? Can we, as Americans, understand ourselves and value ourselves as a country and how do we assert that role in the world? So a lot of it is kind of a lot of considerations and this is what public policy is, balancing these ideas against each other and trying to way out and prioritize which of those in a particular circumstance comes out on top. Um, and that's why there's such a diversity of thought in that area. That's what um, New America does. That's what Cato does. They have different priorities. Perhaps um, the Heritage Foundation would value the strength of, uh, of a military. That's what would win out in a sense, um, compared against the other two. Perhaps uh, the Cato Institute would balance out um, should we be involved in this war at all? And how are we going to pay for it? Um, these are all considerations that we have um, in, in any individual question. But the approach is kind of when you're shining a light through a prism, um, how, how do those different, how does that light shine on the particular policy area? How do we understand it in light of those principles that are kind of our non-negotiables? And then on the next level of policy, how can we find things that are reasonable considerations of those in order to still accomplish the same goal? I hope that helps. That was a bit of a confusing answer. Yeah, I would agree with um, what Colleen said, but I would also uh, just from, so I guess, the more like technical side of things, um, New America is, is not officially nonpartisan. Um, we work with Republicans and we work with Democrats, um, though I think many people would fairly characterize us as probably center left. Um, but however, we have uh, um, 80, over 80% 80 of our funding comes from private um, philanthropic foundations like the Gates Foundation, Ford Foundation, Hewlett Foundation, and not from individuals or parties or, or PACs or anything like that. So um, we have a, an enormous editorial firewall between um, what, what any political party wants, what our funders sort of fund us to do and sort of the, and the research that you all read that is, is all public facing. Um, and so therefore our analysis and sort of our research is always based on on empiric evidence and fact. Um, obviously, we are not naive to the sort of goings on on the Hill or in state legislatures and, and all of that. Um, and we do we do take things like that into consideration, but the, that, that everything that we produce is, is um, pretty much entirely empirical and um, based on it, on the independent research that we have done um, and sort of the, the best outcome weighed against sort of all of the, the political realities of, of the current moment um, to, to produce the best policy. Um, like Colleen was saying. Awesome. Yeah. Great Thank question. Um, and so I see we have some hands raised. Um, Charlie, I believe you are up next. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you all for coming and uh, speaking to us today. It's been really interesting. Um, Riker, I know you mentioned um, that one of the uh, areas of research New America is conducting is in cybersecurity. And to me, and just following the news, it seems like that's a massive issue of this century and the coming decades. Um, so what I'm curious about is what does cybersecurity research look like and what kinds of uh, methods of inquiry are there for cybersecurity? How do you 
measure a country's propensity for a cyber attack and something like that? Is it really coding based or is it more looking at data or current events? Sure. So the cybersecurity is not one of my particular focus areas. So I don't know the nitty gritty, uh, but I can refer to your colleagues who have deeper expertise than I do. Um, but uh, we have a, a really large partnership with um, Florida International University, um, and that focuses primarily on uh, sort of the US military and sort of our, our national infrastructure for cybersecurity and how do we um, secure government systems to prevent against um, hacks by, by, other, by foreign governments and by sort of malicious actors um, worldwide. Um, but if you would like, just um, shoot me your email in the chat and I can connect you with somebody who can give you uh, more details on, on the, the intricacies of cybersecurity research. Perfect, thank you. And I think we have time for one more question if you would like to go, same way. Um, okay, I actually have uh, two questions, so I, I don't know, maybe you can just uh, choose to answer one of them. Uh, so one question I had was, uh, so I'm getting a PhD or like graduating next year, and I was wondering, like starting from the internship and like building a network, uh, like from the internship is the best way to get a job in a think tank like uh, here. And um, so, and what is the like adequate, like what is the uh, entry level job for PhD graduates? Um, and like I, I'm doing kind of information interviews with other people, and uh, some of the some of them say like um, this organization is very hierarchical, and starting from internship is not gonna really get you a higher position because it's um, yeah, especially people who work at international organizations say that. Uh, so they say, oh, if you want to work for um, UN probably don't do internship at UN. Um, so uh, I was wondering um, like how hierarchical it is and how whether internships can make you get to a higher position I think, uh, in, the, in the institute where you work at. And another question is more specific, uh, uh, like Chloe goes to Cato Institute. Um, Cause uh, when I look at the website, it seems like they have a, uh, you have a branch for dedicated to the international, uh, uh, international uh, research. And then uh, I was wondering how dedicated the institute is to the international research arm, uh, because I've talked to some other think tanks and uh, um, yeah, it's, I talked to people who, who worked at Pew before and they say they, uh, I, uh, they focus, uh, they, they do research in Africa, which uh, is my special, uh, regional specialty. Uh, and they say uh, they do research in Africa because they just wanna stay international, but they don't really have expertise on that. So I was wondering whether, how much of a focus uh, there is in Cato Institute for the international research. I'll jump um, on this question because you, for the latter part. So um, we do, while Cato's different departments, uh, the, the bulk of them are domestic focused, um, you know, healthcare, education, et cetera. We have a Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, um, which has a number of other projects under its umbrella. So that is largely looking at human and economic uh, progress and development around the world. They also have a couple of scholars who primarily focus on uh, Latin America and South America. We've got one scholar who focuses on the Muslim world and what that means for liberty and kind of um, how the two interact. Um, humanprogress.org is specifically looking at data around the world compiled by the UN, OECD, uh, IMF, World Bank, et cetera. Um, and so that's really just like a compository of different databases uh, or, or a, a database of different um, uh, um, data and, um, and indicators of human well-being and progress. So on the one hand, we have uh, U.S. foreign policy and defense, which is much more like how does, what should the U.S. defense budget be, and what should U.S. approach to foreign policy be. The Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity is looking at uh, measures of uh, human growth, progress, and indicators of development. And so if you're interested in international policy work, that's kind of um, where I would point you toward. In terms of like a lot of how, uh, how a lot of these organizations are structured, which might be, um, you know, a Middle East center and South America center and, you know, where they're regionally focused, um, Cato's just not that big. And so we don't, we have a couple of different scholars, uh, you know, Sahar Khan, she's focused on Pakistan and U.S. relations and, and the Middle East a little bit, um, but she's not like a Middle Eastern expert. And so, 
um, I would think about it just, it, I would look at some of the scholars, look at what departments they're working in and seeing if any of them are working on stuff that you find interesting that you're also interested in working on. Um, Marion Tupi, who works on humanprogress.org, he's looking at more of Africa development, uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, et cetera. Um, so I hope that answers your question. In terms of a PhD and, and getting, I mean, an intern, we certainly have a couple of uh, PhD candidates who are interns. Um, there's also, uh, we've also had PhD candidates who kind of don't do the internship program, but then go on and do kind of uh, more of a, a visiting fellowship or adjunct stuff. Um, send me an email because that's usually stuff that I try and talk with one-on-one -on -one because it's, it's usually so in particular. Thank you. Well, if we can all just give our panelists a, what, a virtual round of applause here. Uh, this was a fantastic session. Really appreciate all three of you um, for coming out here today and, and speaking with students about your specific work at Think Tanks. Um, students, if you're paying attention in the chat, uh, they have put their emails in there for further contact information. Um, this has been incredible. Really do appreciate your time. And if any of you students want to check this out again, we will be uploading the recording to our video on demand site at the Career Center's website.